Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee, be happy and through Christ our Lord, amen. Our Lady of Divine Grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. One of the phenomena that you will see when you look on the internet, you will see, especially when you read some of the commentary that people put or even in some of the various threads like on Twitter and the like, um, that you will see people are, uh, people will just drop these bombs and they're extraordinarily uncharitable. You also just see in general walking around in the culture today that people are becoming more and more uncharitable towards each other, complete lack of courtesy or just even decency um, to each other. We're also seeing this like, for example, when you're seeing um, people uh, doing the sucker punching and all this. Like we're seeing all this de- decline. And then, of course, in the church, we're seeing um, attacks on tradition. We're seeing attacks um, just all over the place. Even the traditionalists are kind of infighting. And there's uh, just a general lack of charity. Some of this is just due to the fact that uh, I think there's a variety of different causes. The first can just be that um, this gives you an indicator that certain people are benign and nice as long as their life is comfortable. And once you remove that, this lack of virtue just becomes more apparent. Um, that's kind of my theory in relationships because people say, um, you ask me if I think the world is mentally ill. And I think the majority of our people in our culture are now met, or can legitimately be argued to be mentally ill. And they said, did COVID bring it out? And I said, no, I think it really, the real uptick, it's been going on for a while, but the real uptick actually started under Obama. And then now it just kind of came to the surface once Trump got in, then we saw the deranged syndrome, Trump deranged syndrome, where people just are, regardless of what you think of Trump, the fact that people have these just absolutely bizarre and irrational reactions to him is an indicator that there's a lack of virtue uh, and a lack of mental stability. And we're seeing that even, but the charity is also, it's very clear that the charity is lacking. It reminds me of that line from Christ when he refers to the end times. He said, um, charity will go cold and men will become lovers of pleasure. And so I think we're kind of seeing that. So the real question is, is because obviously as faithful Catholics, we want to be as charitable as possible during these times and actually advance our charity in this time um, when there's very little charity and there's a lot of injustice and there's a lot of things that are going on that are just uh, bad and evil. So the question is, is how do you maintain your charity in a time of crisis? And here I'm thinking more in time of crisis. I'm not going to talk so much about the political sphere. I want to talk more about the time of crisis in relationship to the church. Um, And so we want to talk about, you know, how do you maintain your charity in the church when, um, you know, you see certain priests being canceled, but then you see other priests who are flagrantly um, teaching things contrary to the church's moral doctrine, usually in the area of the Sixth Commandment. They're getting promoted and they seem to be fine. They keep their job. They're even, you know, brought over to the Vatican and get general audience or get private audiences and things of that sort. So the question is, is, you know, how do you maintain your charity in all of this? The other thing is too, is, is if you're just trying to defend the Catholic faith, you're gonna come under attack not just by the liberals in the church, but also even by some of the traditionalists who don't know their faith very well, who like to think they do, but they don't. And so the question becomes, how do you maintain your charity? So uh, we first want to, before we talk about maintaining charity, we need to define charity. So before we do that, then I even want to talk about how you actually define a virtue. There's actually a structure that's set up in scholastic theology and philosophy about how you actually parse out what the actual definition of a virtue is. And it's basically, every virtue has four components. So the first of the components has to do with the cause. What's the cause of the virtue? So in this particular case, it's either going to be us, that is the human being himself, or it's gonna be God. So in the case of the human being, it's an acquired virtue In the case of God, it's an infused virtue. The second is the location, that is, which faculty does it reside in? So does it reside in the intellect or the will or the concupiscible appetite or the irascible appetite? Where does it reside? 
And so that's uh, the next. The second one is what we call the matter. This is the, uh, that about which the thing concerns itself. So for example, temperance deals with bodily goods. But it specifically, so that's the matter in that particular case. So in this case, it would be the bodily goods. In the case of temperance, the faculty is, of course, the concupiscible appetite. And it can be either an acquired virtue, as we can grow in temperance ourselves, or we can have the infused virtue of temperance, which is actually ordered towards um, making use of the bodily goods for the sake of achieving God in some fashion. And then, the, then you have the formal aspect of it, which is what aspect of the bodily goods? Because you can look at bodily goods from a variety of different point of view. And in this particular case, it has to do with moderation of pleasure in the case of temperance. So it, it's, you're looking at it from the point of view of pleasure. So this is the structure. So you look at the cause and the faculty in which it resides. Um, and then it also, the matter and form. And then this is going to determine the actual quality of the action which it deals with. Okay. So, in other words, it governs the action of that particular faculty. When you're talking about charity, the cause is obviously God. And it's God, the reason that God is the cause of this is for uh, one primary reason. If you remember in the Gospels, Christ says, love your enemies. He said, if you only love those who... Uh, you know, do good to you. Well, the, Je the, Jew the Gentiles do as much. And in what he's implying there is, is that the natural, there is an actual natural virtue of love. You can actually develop your own natural virtue of love in relationship to those who are part of your family or your friends or things of that sort of acquaintances, people that you actually care for um, and who treat you well. But to be able to love your enemies actually requires something above and beyond what is normal or natural to us as human beings, because naturally as human beings, in fact, if we see somebody who is like gushing and being really emotional and trying to be lovey-dovey to someone who's trying to hurt them, we, we look at that and realize there's some type of disorder here. <clears throat> they're, they're not connecting to the reality of the fact that this person is trying to cause them harm, right? And so we see that there's, this is just weird. And it just seems like this, the person who's doing that is being over-emotional and there's something off mentally in relationship to them. Whereas in, when we see saints who love the, their enemies, it's a whole different kind of a dynamic. And so it has to do with the actual finality, which is part of the um, formality too. But it has to do with the finality. So in the case of the cause and the action, it's ultimately ordering the person in relationship to charity the cause is God on the point of view of the fact that it's above nature. It's not something we can do in relationship to that. There's another aspect, and it has to do with God. So because God, God can be looked at from two different points of view, he can be looked at from the point of view of what I can get from him on a natural level, my relationship to him on a natural level. So, for example, they say you can have an interested love. So there's... Um, you can have an interested, there's two kinds of love. Interested love, this is the one in which you love the person because of the things you're getting from them. So you can love God because of the fact that he gives you a nice house, a car, or money, or he's taking, providing for you, gives you good food, etc., um, or provides a good wife, or whatever the case is. But you can look at it because you're getting something from him. So in the end, in the, the terminus of interested love is ourselves. St. Thomas calls this love um, amor simpliciter, which is love in the, in the uh, simply speaking. Simpliciter, that's an R. So, uh, and this is just love simply speaking, where you just love the person because of something you're getting out of it. But then there is a disinterested love. And this, we get a semblance of it. This is where you will the good for the other person for their sake. So the definition of love is willing the good of another. The willing the, the good of the other can be for myself or it can be for the other, for the actual, I want what's good for them, whether I get anything out of it or not. Now, parents obviously have a sense of this. They'll very often do things for their kids, purely for the kids' sake, even though they have to sacrifice, they're not getting anything out of it. 
they are actually getting something out of it in the sense of, because it always is intermixed with the, with the uh, love in the simplest sense, in the sense that they get the satisfaction of seeing what's good, that they're doing good for their child, etc. So they can get to it for the delight that they get out of it. But the point being is, is that this disinterested love in relationship to God, St. Thomas says, it is impossible to have a disinterested love um, and he calls this a more secundum quid in a certain respect. So this love, it's, he says, it's impossible to will the good for God purely for God's sake. And he says the reason being is, is because that act of love falls upon an object that's above and beyond us. See, this we're ultimately just loving ourselves when we do the interested love. But when we're loving God purely for his own sake, that is an activity that's above and beyond our natural capacities. As a result of that, charity is the virtue. Okay, so it's a virtue, and a virtue is a good habit. It's in a particular faculty, which we'll see here in a minute. But the action is love in this particular case. Which is very important. I'm sure you've heard this on my other conferences when I say, chair, they, for instance, they always translate that thing, you know, love is patient, love is kind. No, it's not. Charity is patient, charity is kind. In the Greek and the Latin, there's not a single extant text in Latin or Greek, I haven't looked at the Hebrew, the Latin or Greek that uses love in that particular case. They all use the word charity. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is, is because charity transcends the particular things that affect us and that would cause us to, to be taken away, that would take away from us, take us away from, um, you know, loving in a proper sense. Okay, so that being said, because the, um, the object, the matter in this particular case is, in the case of charity, the actual object or the matter is actually God. He's the object that you're loving, and you're loving him for his own sake. And so that, in Latin, St. Thomas uses over and over again as proctor deum. It's for God's sake. If you love God for your own sake, which we see people doing all the time, this is one of the reasons why people want to go to Mass and get a certain kind of uh, emotional experience out of it. This is why I tell even traditionalists, you shouldn't be going to the traditional Latin mass because of the fact of what you're emotionally getting out of it or, or what you think you're getting out of it. You should ultimately be going it because it's the highest form of worship for God. And so that's why you should do it. doesn't mean that you can't, you know, appreciate those things when God does give you that deep satisfaction and joy or peace by being present at it for God's sake. So you have to do it for God's sake. So... God is its cause because this act of love that, I, that you perform for God's sake is above what human beings are capable of doing. And because it's an activity that's above what we're capable of doing, we can't perform that act, A, without God giving us the grace, but B, without him giving us the virtue, which makes it possible for us to actually perform that activity. Because this activity of loving God for his own sake is, again, something that's above and beyond human nature. And so God's got to give us a virtue that makes it that possible. Okay, so in the case of uh, charity, charity is an infused virtue. So that's the first part of the definition and the cause. It's an infused virtue residing in the will. Because why? The will is the faculty that loves. By which, through the action by which, we love God, so God is the matter. And then the formal aspect is this, for the sake of God, for God's sake. Now, this proctor deum is gonna become very important because Christ then says, well, what the, the two precepts of charity are love of God and love of neighbor for the sake of God. Okay, so even when you're, um, you're loving your neighbor, it's still for the sake of God, ultimately. It's under that aspect. If you're just loving your neighbor for his sake, that's just the natural virtue of love, okay? It's not the supernatural virtue of love. This proctor deum becomes very key. So the object, there's, there's a few things that become really important in maintaining your charity in this time of crisis, okay? 
So if you just look at the definition, we can actually see what the story is. First, as human beings, especially because of fallen original human nature, uh, fallen human nature because of original sin and because of our own actual sins, when we're around a lot of negativity and we're around a lot of negative and bad and evil people, our natural tendency is to get sucked into that and to start judging them negatively and we start becoming like them in a certain sense by becoming negative and uh, by becoming nasty and etc. Okay. As a result of that, what that tells us is, is that uh, in order to perform this act of charity um, or to actually love my neighbor even in that time, that is when, for example, in the church, when we have, for example, the traditionals currently are feeling like they're under attack by um, Archbishop Roach and um, even by the Holy, now Cardinal, I guess, uh, Roach, and sometimes in a certain sense by the Holy Father, etc. they're feeling under attack from them, uh, that we're not even considering what the intention is on their side of the equation. We're just looking at our own experiences is that we're feeling like we're under attack. It's very easy for us to get sucked into that and for us to be able to transcend that, that means that we're gonna to have to have a perspective, which is what this Proctor Dame is, we're gonna to have to have a perspective to keep us from doing that. But it also tells us another thing. We cannot have charity for those who are trying to cause us harm without God being the cause. You cannot do it on your own. That's the first thing that we have to realize is it's not just about being nice and kind in the face of this stuff because that's just weird, right? That's, we, as I mentioned before, about the person who's like really kind and nice despite the fact that the other person's yelling and screaming and trying to hurt them, right? There's just something disordered. It's not proportionate. So what has to happen is, is that the, there has to be some proportion between the love that we have for the person and something regarding the person, which we'll see here in a minute. So the first point is, is that God has to be the cause. That also means that in relationship to doing charity on a regular basis, you're going to ask, have to ask our Lord and our Lady to give you the grace, which is something which she does. She gives the grace, to get, lightens the mind, and strengthens the will, but it prompts the will to perform the act of charity. Because otherwise, as human beings, we're generally not going to do it. And so we need that act, that grace, to do, regularly do it. So there has to be, in order to have that perfect charity, in the face of adversity, but in, in, the, in the time of crisis within the church, it absolutely has to become a dependency on God. Because without that, it's just not going to happen. Right? Okay. So, the second thing, okay, so there's that. The other thing is willing the good of the other. Therein lies a particular thorny issue. One of the effects of original sin in the will is malice. Now, malice, St. Thomas defines as willing the lesser good, or willing, uh, yeah, willing the lesser good over the greater good. And so, if you actually look at the person who, you know, the evil person like Hitler who was going around killing people, etc., in his, he was willing the lesser good. He's still pursuing some good under the aspect of the good, but it's not a morally good thing. Right? And that's the key aspect about malice. It's not just, you know, do I choose a Bentley or a Porsche? You know, and we're not talking about one car being above the other and I choose the lesser car. We're talking about where I'm choosing a lesser good so it's some natural good, but that's in point in fact morally bad. Okay. So in willing the good of another, which is what the definition of love is, with charity, I have to be, and this is where we get back to this interested love and disinterested love. If I'm going to be able to love my enemies, you know, through charity, I have to be willing their good. I have to do it. I have to will their good in a disinterested fashion. I can't be, if I'm trying to will their good because I want something that's good about them for myself, well, they're not good. They're causing me a lot of damage. And so, technically speaking, the natural reaction is to turn away from them, okay? In fact, in the Old Testament, the reason they're told to love God and hate their enemies is because he's, in, the, in the Old Testament, he's just trying to set up the natural order that should no, normally apply, 
which is you should stay away from your enemies. You should avoid your enemies and, and, and hate them in the sense of hate being defined as turning away from them. You should, you should not be letting your enemies into your camp, etc. He's just trying to set up a natural right order. And then it's in the New Testament that he layers on top of that. Actually, it's towards the end of the Old Testament because you start seeing it in some of the prophets. But the, uh, it's, uh, it's, if, when, you get to the, um, when you get to the New Testament, what he's doing is saying, okay, now that you have this right order on a natural level, now here's how you find the perfection in that order in relationship to achieving God, okay, which is loving your neighbor for the sake of God. And so there, but we're back to this. It has to be willing the good of these people whether we get anything out of it or not. That's the real rub. People will, I've read this recently online where people say, I can't pray for the Holy Father. I just cannot pray for that man. Well, look it. What you're really telling me is that you can't pray for this guy because then you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it, ultimately. Whereas you should be able to be willing to pray for him or pray for any bishop in the church that's causing damage or what have you. You should be willing to pray for them purely for their good. Mm. Ultimately, we should want the Pope and these bad bishops to convert, which is the good for them. We should want their conversion so that ultimately they can be in heaven and we can be friends in heaven. Now, people think, I don't want to be friends with that guy. No, you're thinking of, him, you're thinking of these guys in their current disorder. In heaven, no one's disordered. These people are going to be love. If they make it to heaven, they will be lovely to be around. And that's what we actually have to work towards, right? Because that's ultimately what we want. But it also, if we, if we are not willing to love them for their sake, that is, if we're not willing to um, be charitable to them in the sense of willing what's best for them, um, you know, for their sake, in fact, if we're not willing to pray for them, we're not willing to do this, that's malice, that's, where, that, that's what we're dealing with is malice in that particular case because you will the lesser evil. You actually will that they don't make it to heaven, and you do. Well, no, the better good is both of you make it, right? Okay. So there has to be this disinterested aspect. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to will what's best for this person for their sake, right? But in this particular case, when you're talking about uh, a more simplistic, uh, um, the, the disinterested love, in this particular case, what makes it possible, see, you can't, in the, as I mentioned, in the Old Testament, God's just trying to establish rationality here, right? It's not rational to will the good of somebody, especially in an interested sense, who's causing you harm and damage, right? And so on a natural level, we have a natural inclination not to will the good for those who are causing us harm, Okay. We can also argue that we, we can in the sense that we can try and achieve better for them, which is true. That's part of the natural virtue club. But it's not done for a higher virtue. So what the propter deum gives, if you're doing it for God's sake, that's what gives the, that does two things. The propter deum is both the finality, why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for God. That's why I'm doing this. I want God's glory manifested even in this guy's life, even in these people, even in this time of crisis. Right? And so you're doing it because you want to see God's glory manifest. You're doing it for God. The second part of it is um, it has to do with the object of love. You're really only loving this particular individual when you're talking about charity in the strict sense, not for their sake but not for your sake, but ultimately for God's sake. It's a matter of keeping the perspective. And that means that the ultimate thing that you're loving and loving your neighbor is God. This is why St. Paul said, God is all things in all. This is why Our Lady has the highest level of charity, because any interaction she has had with any creature her entire life, anything, has always been under the aspect of charity, which means ultimately everything about her life completely revolved around God and nobody else. 
right? And so this is important because it tells us that this is, she's the ideal. That being said, the way we keep our perspective primarily then, okay, so let's start parsing some of this out. So the primary, one of the ways that you keep your uh, charity in the time of crisis is you have to become dependent on God in your spiritual life. You cannot do it on your own. It is not possible. So given how bad things are, the people who are going to be, be the most charitable are those who realize, I can't do this on my own. They also recognize their own wretchedness. In other words, they're humble people. They look at their humility and they realize, this is my disorders. The only way I'm going to be charitable to these people is if God gives me the ability to do so. So they have to start asking for God's um, uh, help in this regard. Second, and the, that, So there's that. You have to realize that. Connected to that is the realization. Because it's an infused virtue, St. Thomas says, we are not its cause. And that means not just causing it to begin to exist in my life, but even increasing it once I have it. Once I have charity. I can't even increase charity on my own. In fact, St. Thomas says that even when I perform an act of charity where I love my neighbor for the sake of God or love God... I'm just loving God himself. He said, that itself is not a proportionate or sufficient cause to increase the virtue. He says, but I perform these acts of charity, which we'll see what that is here in a minute. I perform these acts of charity so that my, I be, my faculty in the will becomes more disposed towards an increase in that virtue. So what do I do? So if I want to increase charity, I perform acts of charity. And then St. Thomas says, and then God subsequently infuses the virtue, an increase of the virtue in my faculty. This is why it's a very common experience. People will do it. Well, I don't feel like I love God very much. It doesn't matter. Just tell him you love him. Just keep telling him you love him. And then just keep doing that. And then over the course of time, they start to, they start to recognize, actually, they, do, they are starting to love him. They are starting to. It's, and it's the same thing with human beings, right? In the sense that uh, if we're being charitable to people, we have to start making acts of love for, of, for them, for God's sake, which basically means praying for them, doing certain things for God's sake in relationship to them. And then over the course of time, our charity towards them will increase. We cannot cause it on our own. Being warm and sappy towards somebody is not, not going to increase your charity. What's going to increase your charity is doing good things for them, praying for them, willing what's best for them on a regular, but for God's sake, ultimately. Wanting to see God in their life, okay? And not for a selfish motive, right? I want God in their life so I don't have to deal with them. Yeah, it's not that, okay? So this act of love is a supernatural act, and as a result, God has to give us an infused virtue so that we can perform it. And that means the way that we increase virtue, uh, that charity, even for our neighbors so that we can love them better, is telling God we love him on, at regular intervals and doing it regularly. The concomitant side to that then also means if I'm willing to good for another person, then I have to be willing to suffer in relationship to that person. Any emotional negative reaction is a sign that I haven't mastered that virtue. And any time I react contrary to charity, I increase that, those vices and disorders, and it's going to block the operations of charity. That brings a very, up a very important point. St. Thomas says that an infused virtue becomes operative, A, from an in, it becomes more and more operative from an increase in the virtue. But it also becomes more operative from a removal of any natural vices which block its operation. So, for example, everybody who is in the state of grace has infused temperance. Right? Even the guy who's obese, 350 pounds, you know, if he's in the state of grace and he's woofing down his fourth Big Mac, right? He, has, he may not be committing a mortal sin yet, and so he's in the state of grace. And they're like, well, wait a minute, if he has infused temperance, what's with the fourth Big Mac, right? And the reason being is because he's got the vice of intemperance. And so the natural vice of intemperance blocks the infused virtue of temperance from its operation. And he says, that's why once you remove that vice, the natural vice, this is, what we, this is why you have to remove your defects. As you remove your defects, 
and remove those things and start building natural virtue, then the supernatural virtue starts to just operate because it's not being blocked. It's the same thing here with charity. If you don't have the, if you're not performing acts of love on a regular basis, and then when the, the suffering comes in relationship to the individual, you still do not, but you will the evil in relationship to that person. That habit in the will blocks charity from being uh, performed in a relationship to them. You have to be willing to suffer that and still be, which basically means I still want the good for them despite what I'm going through on my side. And that will actually, if you're willing to suffer well, then if you suffer well, if you've mastered that virtue, you'll find that charity will drastically improve. How do we know we're suffering well? Do you ever get angry or sad? Or what, you know, do, you, do you have strong reactions when people do things that might hurt you? If you don't, well, then that's a sign that, that you've probably reached a certain level of virtue. Okay. So, performing acts of virtue on a regular basis, removing any obstacles that could be, that could be causing that. This, the other part is keeping the perspective this finality, this proper day, it's all about perspective. This is where the rubber meets the road with the traditionalists, because the traditionalists are losing their perspective. They see how bad things are in the church, and they're like Chicken Little running around, you know, saying all sorts of stuff that's just ridiculous. And the problem is that um, they are, as I mentioned, they're losing their perspective. And so they easily degenerate into a lack of charity. How do we keep our perspective when we have all sorts of heresy? In fact, we are living in modernism, which is a synthesis of all heresies. There's not a single doctrine of the Catholic Church. There's not a single moral practice of the Catholic Church. There's not a single liturgical practice of the Church that isn't under full-blown attack right now. That's just the nature of the circumstances which we live in. As I've mentioned before in other conferences, this should not affect our perspective at all. And there's two reasons for it. One is it doesn't matter what other people do. St. Thomas says we can't take that as scandal to affect our own action. That's called passive taking, or that's called passive scandal. And he said, that's sinful. You can't do that. The second part, so it doesn't matter what anyone does in the church. It doesn't matter what any prelate in the church does. It doesn't matter what any priest in the church does. It should not affect your faith or your virtue or your perspective on any of this. If for no other reason, the church said, well, these people are sinful so they can commit anything. The second component is we knew all this was going to happen. We knew it. We've been told for a century and a half by Our Lady, this is what's going to happen. We were told by Our Lady at La Salette that the priests are cesspools of impurity. Well, why should the 150 layers later, when there hasn't been any substantial rooting of that problem out, that we think that somehow or another we should be scandalized at the, at the pedophilia? I mean, it's there's, I mean, the, the other thing is, is that, you know, we talk about um, Fatima. You know, if you actually look at what Our Lady was telling us in Fatima, she said she wanted the Pope to consecrate Russia by name. And what she was telling us, uh, she said, otherwise it will spread her errors. Russia will spread her errors. Okay. What she was telling us is that either Russia will become the blessing of humanity because it will be converted. And in that conversion, the impact geopolitically would be staggering. Or it will be our punishment. Russia will be used as an instrument of our punishment. Well, we didn't do what we were supposed to do, and here we are, right? So there shouldn't be any shocking that the church got infiltrated by communists. We shouldn't be shocked that it got infiltrated by Freemasons. We shouldn't be shocked at the fact that we have bishops who have, you know, imploded morally. We already know, we are, we are told that we shouldn't be shocked by the fact that the bishops are infighting and the cardinals are infighting. Why? Because she said at Akita, Pope will be, or bishop will be against bishop and cardinal will be against cardinal. We were told all of this. We shouldn't be at all scammed. In fact, what it should tell us is that our perspective should be even more solidified in the truth of the Catholic faith, in these revelations, in our Lord, in our Lady. It should be even more solidified in that. It tells you how pusillanimous we are. And it tells us how weak we are that, you know, some cardinal gets up there and says something that's extraordinarily daft. And everybody knows it's daft. 
He even knows it's daft, but he still says it anyway. And we all get tore up about it. We shouldn't be getting tore up about it. It shouldn't affect our perspective in the slightest. What it should do is, is indicate to us, this guy needs our prayers. As a matter of charity, I'm going to pray for this guy. Or as a matter of charity, I'm going to offer up my sufferings for this guy. Even when they're attacking you personally, it should not affect your perception. If your charity was perfect, your will and your intellect would be so focused on God that in that particular moment, all you would be seeing is either God in this person in some fashion or the necessity of bringing God into the situation. But we don't. What we tend to do is we tend to become, uh, we follow the way of all flesh. Somebody does something negative against us, and so we retaliate. You know, it's an eye for an eye and truth for truth. But in, what's becoming in our culture, though, is, is because people are so unhinged, so even basic reasoning isn't being followed. That tells you how people, how much reason they're following their emotions. And therein lies the story, the moral to the story. The moral of the story is you have to get to the point where you are not following your emotions in your reactions in relationship to other people. If you're going to maintain charity, even in the worst situations and even in the crisis within the church and seeing all these bad things and dealing with all these bad things, because I know that a lot of people have had to deal with a lot of garbage, even traditional per, uh, parishioners have had to deal with a lot of garbage at the hands of the traditional priests. The fact of the matter is, if you're going to maintain your charity, you've got to stop following your emotions. Okay? And you're going to have to keep your focus on God, which means you're going to follow Him. Right? Okay. So you have to be willing to suffer, you have to keep your focus, and you have to be working on increasing your love for God, which tells me you have to let, you have to performing acts of charity at regular intervals. That's how you're going to keep your focus in this crisis. Any questions? Yeah. You know, when I, when I, get, I was thinking when you were talking about this, um, without God, there's no way society's ever going to make. No, yeah. not ultimately. Yeah, because someone's going to. Well, if you don't do what I want, you know, and, and this is yeah. so we're not going to have any peace. Um. <coughs> no, in fact, to the point without God over the course of time, people just degenerate into fall, you know, towards the trajectory of fallen human nature and the effects of sin. Yeah. I mean, you see this in every single culture. Right. So unless God props it up, but that's how you something, though. It also tells you that the people in the culture, if... If you're going to keep God on your side and keep your culture existing for a long period of time, mm -hmm. you're going to have, people are going to have to maintain their Catholicity and their virtue. And they're going to have to be doing, you know, they're going to have to maintain their level of holiness because that's when he's going to protect you. It's when people start slacking off on that. It's, it's you know, I, one of the things that I've noticed in our own culture, you know, when you look at how things were on a cultural level a hundred years ago, or even put it, well, not in the 20s, because 20s is a bit of a mixed bag. But let's just say in the 30s and 40s, you know, like grandfathers, when their, their generation, when they were raising kids and that type of thing. There was a certain civility and right order that people just had, right? And I thought to myself, how did we go from that to the greatest generation which inherited that, but by the time they got done... They handed us a financially, spiritually, and morally bankrupt church. They handed us a culture that had been basically destroyed. I mean, how did, what happened? And it, I basically came to the conclusion that God decided to retract his grace because they were unwilling to suffer. It was retraction of grace. Once they decided they, weren't, they just didn't want to suffer, then, well, then God's out, right? And that's why I said to maintain the charity. You have to be willing to suffer, but you see that in their generation. They didn't want to suffer. They didn't want to embrace their cross. And as a result of that, that's why it imploded. There was a retraction of God's grace during that generation. And I think there was a kind of a warning. I mean, I think the fact that Our Lady appeared in Fatima in 1917 was a warning. You know, this is coming. You know, and once he retracts his grace then it's impossible to keep evil people from infiltrating the church or, and, the, and the culture or keeping evil people from gaining ascendancy. It's just impossible. Because if, you, if God retracts his grace, then good men don't do what they're supposed to do mm -hmm. to protect it. Yes? So when you give us um, 
some advice about how to maintain our perspective? Yeah, I think it's... Turn off the TV. Yeah, well, there you go. Turn off the TV, stay off the news, the, the media. You got to get, get away from this stuff because it's by reading this stuff over... And people spend hours and hours and hours reading about all the problems of the church. Well, why wouldn't you think you'd be sucked into the, the vortex, so to speak? Okay. Pun intended. Okay. <laughs> so the point being is, is that you have to turn that stuff off. In other words, you've got to stop the flood. You still have to pay attention to what's going on for the sake of basic prudence, what's going on in the world. And, you know, there's varying degrees of knowledge that you can have of it. But if it starts to affect your charity or it starts to affect your perspective, then you've got to stop that. The second thing is, is that if you're already trying to do everything for God's sake, God is your perspective. He's the perspective on it. Making acts of faith at regular intervals. Just reflect, just doing prayer, basic prayer where you're focusing on God, but also just reflecting on what I just said before. We knew this was going to happen. In the end, this should solidify our faith because why? God, who told us who we should trust and believe in, has told us this is what's going to happen. And so when it happens, we realize, oh, well, he's telling us the truth. So it should actually confirm our trust in him. Because he said, this is what's going to happen. But then our lady... Is, Immaculate heart will triumph. We know that's going to happen. So our, our, our function in this area, or what our duty and task is in this time frame, is to learn to suffer well through the process so that when we come out the other end, we can be part of her triumph. That's what our, our goal should be. So it's a matter of, you know, just don't, you know, don't get sucked into all the negativity and just keep that, it, making acts of faith and recognizing this is, God is still in charge. You know, the other thing is, too, is people just don't seem to understand. You know, we've got this idea that somehow or another, and you even hear this, you know, when you listen to the guys in the World Economic Forum, especially Klaus Schwab, we can determine the future of humanity. You can't determine what, you know, what car you got in that day. I mean, you can't even determine whether you can sneeze or not. And it's, it's you know, and it's literally one of those things where, um, and this is something that I've just kind of noticed. If God is literally, if nothing, that literally nothing can exist, nothing can exist without God being its cause. Not even any activity can exist without God being its immediate cause. That being the case, it means literally all he's got to do is retract his causation and he can block anything from happening. And that means he can determine absolutely every facet of history down to the iota if he wants to. And we already know that he's already determined the flow of history where it's going. We already know that. Because he told us, Christ told us, this is what's going to happen. And so he's going to make sure, he's going to, it's going to, we know the Antichrist is coming eventually, not necessarily right away, but we know he's coming. So, you know, when he comes, people shouldn't be running around like their head with their head cut off. We knew because he said this, I'm, he's going to be. And why is he bringing him here? For the ultimate defeat and humiliation of Satan and for the demons. That's why. And to have his ultimate victory and to usher in the time of the final judgment and, the, and his final glory. So we know that that's, what's, that's why it's there. The point being is it's all about um, acts of faith and recognizing we already know. He's taught us this. I believe it. Right? And so it's a matter of making acts of faith in relationship to those things to keep your perspective. Yes? Well, you didn't mention that you need to steer away from politics, but I guess the court should be praying for bishops and folks who are saying um, things yeah. that are wrong. They should be doing the same for political people as hard as that would be. Yeah, that's true. No, I agree. I think even in relationship to politics, we should be praying for these people. You have to remember, we, our lady predicted this, because she said, you know, just about the time it looks like communism has taken over the whole world, God will intervene. Well, we're there. So we know, because the Pope didn't consecrate Russia in a timely manner, we know that they're going to basically get to the point where they pretty much take over. Well, we're there. Why are we surprised and shocked? And why does this tear us up? Well, it shouldn't. We should know. Well, okay, our lady told us. This also means, okay, we're about to get spanked. Let's endure our spanking well. And then when we come out the other end, you know, Our Lady will triumph. Yeah. Are there any saints that you would recommend as far as their intercession and praying for the clergy, like St. John Vianney, or any that you would Yeah, I think recommend? so. 
I think so. I think it depends on what you see the problem that the clergyman is having. So, for example, St. Joan of Arc is the, is the saint that you pray for um, prelates or people who are trying to gain ascendancy in the church out of ambition and they're, that are betraying the church. So she'd be the one to pray for that. Mm. Or you would pray, uh, and you could also pray, I think, St. John Vianney, um, I think, um, and, you know, any of the priestly saints throughout history. And for the religious orders, I mean, I think for the Jesuits, we should be praying to St. Ignatius and St. Francis, all the major saints there. I think it just depends on also if the person is struggling with chastity or the priest is having a problem in that area. We should be praying to St. Monica and St. Augustine and those times. So some of it is too is just who you have your own devotion to. I think ultimately in the end though, um, the only one who God is going to allow to take back the clergy on Moss will be Our Lady. She's got to take them back. Yeah, I think holy hours, I think um, having masses said for them, I think just offering up our prayers, suffering and good works for the reparation. Actually, reparation is actually um, an act of charity towards God. So it's ultimately done to um, ameliorate how he's been offended. And that's one of the things I've actually been thinking of doing a conference on it, but it's, I suppose I can just kind of deal with it now. You know, we all talk about how bad these things are and how bad the bishops are behaving and, you know, and all the people mm-hmm. in the Vatican are behaving. And we, we're talking about how, you know, we're, we're just miffed about what's, what our politicians are saying and doing. But nobody's talking about the fact that the one who takes the greatest amount of offense in all this is God. He's the one that's offended the most. The fact that we're offended, well, we kind of deserve it, frankly, given our sinfulness. He doesn't deserve any of this. And he's the one that's the most offended. And yet nobody's talking about this. It's the same problem that you see, you know, when they talk about, oh, well, you know, and this is actually what Leo XIII was dealing with when they said, you know, um, the, the, the argument that came up in Vatican II said that, um, you know, you can't force a person's conscience and so they have the right to worship God according to their conscience. And Leo XIII already dealt with that. He said, no, 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 no. God has a right, God's right to rightly ordered worship trump the conscience of the creature. Mm-hmm. And so, they, you know, and there's, a, there's a, an attitude that, you know, because God's so, mer- it, it's, a, it's kind of a slippery slope. God's merciful. He's, you know, and then they stress that to such a point where they forget about his justice. But they, they stress that to such a point that it becomes the point where he's, God is just doesn't even care if you're sinning or not. Right? And that's just not true. So I think the reparation needs to be made in relationship to all this offense that he's taking. Yeah. Well, I think, well, I think people still have to do their basic civil duty, which the Pope has talked about. So that, there's that. But it's, it's like I mentioned before, it's the same problem in relationship with the church. We're never going to get this political situation straightened out until we become holy. And so, it, you, you know, it doesn't matter who becomes president. It literally does not matter who becomes president. Nothing is going to substantially change until human beings start to become holy. Because you get the leaders you deserve. Quite frankly, we deserve Biden. You know? Well, Trump was, yeah. I mean, you can have all sorts of interpretations on why we got allowed Trump. But the fact of the matter is, is that we, we did, in fact, what we, what's, what's coming down the pike, if people don't get their act together, is someone even worse than Biden. That's what's coming. If people don't stop it, 
You know, if they don't stop their sin and start turning back to God, then we're just going to continue getting the leaders we deserve, and we're getting worse and worse, and this is just going to get uglier. And this is why I tell people the only solution to this is that we have to become holy. That's the only way we're going to merit God correcting the situation. We are not capable of correcting this situation. And the, the last election, if anything, in fact, the last two years have shown us, if anything, we have lost control of our government. We have, um, and I think there are indicators of that for quite, while, quite a while, but we've lost control of it. And so, the, I mean, we still have to do our civic duty and do what we can to slow that down or to, to counter that. But in the end, the only way it's going to ever get straightened out is through, through um, holiness. Yeah, I mean, you were saying that the reason things went down down the tubes is because God retracted, retracted his, his grace. grace. Yeah. So the only way it's going to come back is he's got to start flooding the world with grace, which actually tells you something, right? Yeah. Because who did he set up as the solution to communism? Our Lady, yeah. the mediatrix of oh, all grace. Right. Yeah. She's the solution. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's true. I also think that she he set her up in this time in the church to be the solution to the modernist heresy because the modernist heresy is the synthesis of all heresies well she's the conquerors of all heresies so she is the she is the solution that god has set up for this